What's up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today, I'm super excited because we have a very special guest who will be discussing some very underground and novel research chemicals, and we'll be talking all things brain optimization. So today I have Sir Satellot. Welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me, and I'm happy to be on, and uh, let's get into it. Yeah, I'm totally ready. Yeah, awesome. So... A number of uh, your audience and even I've had a few people reach out to me mentioning that I should get you on the podcast and, you know, that you're, you're a wealth of knowledge when it comes to research chemicals and novel nootropics. Um, so maybe, dude, did you want to like share with my listeners, like how did you become so fascinated into brain optimization? So actually, I, I didn't know that I was even going to care about this stuff. Like in the beginning, um, I was actually just... Uh, trying to help my own depression. And um, so I would kind of just go online, I would research things a little bit. And um, I discovered something called agmatine sulfate. And it straight up cured my depression uh, about one hour after using the first one gram dose. And it was it was like a legitimate thing that I struggled with for years. And to just have it like just go like that, without having to use an SSRI or anything like that it, it made me actually believe in this whole thing instead of like uh just like dismissing them or you know saying that nootropics don't work or this doesn't work that doesn't work like it, it made me believe in the idea um and so for a while I would go online and I would try to help people with like supplements and things that they could take uh to kind of improve their daily lives to make their lives better and over time I just started to fall in love with the science and I fell in love with the idea of cognition enhancement. Um, I learned about Cornelio Gariga, the guy that invented paracetam. And I, um, I basically developed like a methodology for finding new chemicals, new uh, areas of the brain that could be explored and um, cognition enhancement in healthy people to the, to the highest extent. That's what I do, you know, so. I, I've, I've definitely been inspired by that experience. Yeah, I think we we definitely share something in common there that we love to both like uncover and discover new mechanistic pathways, new novel compounds and molecules that can, I guess, like enhance human existence and various elements of human performance. Um, but I'd love to go back to your experience with agmat agmatine. Um, for those listening in, agmatine is a metabolite of arginine, the amino acid. Um, and agmatine is an NMDA antagonist, I believe. So maybe do you want to sort of explore the mechanisms behind which, you know, agmatine may. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's actually really cool about agmatine in particular is that it's a polyamine uh, site antagonist of the NMDA receptor. And what the polyamine site is, is it's basically where things like uh, polyamine, so like spermidine, spermine, that's where they bind and that's where they activate the uh, NMDA receptor. And what's really interesting is that it promotes the synaptic uh, expression of NMDA over the extrasynaptic um, sites. So um, one thing that I didn't know, and this is actually totally recent for me, is that extrasynaptic NMDA receptors are um, necessary for recovering from social defeat stress, which is one of the the leading, um, it's one of the leading things that is believed to cause depression, social anxiety, and um, schizophrenia too has a, a pretty big role. And so agmatine as the um, polyamine site antagonist would block the binding of spermidine. And uh, spermidine has actually been fa found higher in deceased depression uh, victims that kill themselves and it, agmatine has been found lower. So that kind of gives like a little bit of a breakdown. So synaptic NMDA uh, overexpression and extrasynaptic underexpression um, can actually worsen things for some people. Um, even though the extrasynaptic NMDA receptors are necessary uh, for cell death in the brain, uh, neuron death, um, and synaptic uh, is neuroprotective. Um, 
but you know that's that's also why I've been developing some new agents that kind of get the best of both worlds and the glutamate receptors and uh, fine tune them to achieve the greatest possible benefits with the least amount of unwanted side effects. So mm, yeah, that's, that's like kind of what TAC six by three and nevoglumine have been about. Well, this is what I'm very excited to discuss is some of these um these novel compounds TAC six five three and nevoglumine. Um, you mentioned a, uh, a model in which they assess like, or they use in like depression or um, PTSD, the social defeat stress. Did, do you mm -hmm. want to sort of explain that to my audience? Like, what does that actually mean? Okay. So the social de defeat model of stress and depression is they'll basically get like a, a male rodent and they'll put like a glass uh, screen and on the other side, they'll have a female rodent with a bigger male. So they basically get like <laughs> cut and uh, it's not nice. And you know, like the, the, the male mice obviously get pretty depressed and they, it's just like a good representation uh, of what kind of happens to a lot of people in the real world. You know, life isn't necessarily fair and how we adapt and overcome that stress is essential for our character development, uh, for what we can achieve in life. And it's just, it's absolutely uh, important for cognition too, because it, it's a sign of neuroplasticity. So a lot of drugs, they'll, they'll put uh, rodents through the social defeat model. And if the rodents can uh, get out of that, that depressive mind state faster, it's kind of just like a sign uh, that a positive change has happened, especially if it's not like a anti-cognitive compound, uh, like many uh, antidepressants tend to be. And also, I believe like they've, they've probably used that model to assess other compounds, such as potentially even other like amine, random like amino acids, maybe like glycine or some other herbal adaptogens, maybe rhodiola, um, bacopa monnieri. Like I'd imagine it, it's been used in other applications, in other for other assessments as well, right? Absolutely. So obviously you've just briefly mentioned this. Um, we've sort of briefly discussed the NMDA antagonism of the polyamine site by agmatine, but let's talk about this new and underground compound known as TAC, T-A-K-653. Where did you first learn about this? Why were you interested and explore some of its um, effects in, in studies? So I don't know, you've probably heard of paracetam, right? Yeah, right? of course. <laughs> That's the first nootropic that was ever created. And um, it was an AMPA positive allosteric modulator. And um, there's been a number of AMPA hands for short that have been developed uh, in recent years. And TAC is one of the more recent ones. And um, there's basically, there's a multitude of studies that show them uh, working in healthy people uh, and enhancing various aspects of cognition, such as verbal fluency, um, just generalized executive function, and um, um, some EEG readings as well that would be a predictor of higher intelligence. And basically what TAC-653 is, is it's this AMPA uh, positive allosteric modulator that was the most selective to the allosteric site. So since it was more selective to the allosteric site and it didn't have any uh, agonist affinity, not only did it improve cognition more, but it was safer. And this applies to a lot of different nootropics because things such as Nupept have been shown to have uh, some slight agonist affinity, which might be why a lot of people report like short-term memory loss on it and things like that. And another thing on Nupept is that it's also a uh, HIF, um, propyl hydroxylase inhibitor. And I'm about to start carrying a compound called roxadustat, which does that more selectively. So, you know, TAC and roxadustat would be like new pet times a thousand. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, so it's more selective. So it, it improved cognition more. And that is, you know, obviously pretty important for things such as IQ, um, which I won't expound upon, but it was, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely one of the coolest projects that have graced the nootropic community since it even came into existence. Of course, expounding upon the uh, first nootropic that was ever made and just 
going as far as you could with it. And there probably won't be a uh, another thing that comes close to TAC that's another AMPA hand for a while. And it, it was tested in healthy people uh, where it improved cognition. And it was also shown to be safe without any side effects or any weird uh, high or anything like that. Just selectively improved cognition in many ways, but it was developed as an antidepressant um, because of the ketamine theory of depression. This is fascinating. Um, I'd love to, I'd love to learn more about, so models of IQ, of, of intelligence. I mean, obviously there's different forms of intelligence, um, emotional intelligence and things like that. Um, you're mentioning, are you mentioning, is it fluid intelligence or, or IQ itself? Um, I would say perhaps both. So, um, I guess it's, you know, you increase IQ, then it's pretty relevant to just generalized intelligence. I mean, mm. it's not perfect, but it's, it's one of the better models that we have right now. So, um, yeah. And what sort of, what sort of dosages were they using in the study? And also do we have data about like, it's the LD 50, for example, uh, the LD50, I believe, is a lot higher than the compound's therapeutic doses. Um, I imagine, especially in comparison to other AMPA PAMs, since it has a much uh, better seizure threshold. Um, mm. So seizure isn't a risk with TAC because of the way it was developed. Um, so there's that. And what was the other question you asked? And the dosages they were using in, in some of those studies, like oral, was it oh, oral right. That's dosing? what I was going to say. Uh, half a milligram and six milligrams is what they tested. And half a milligram wasn't great for cognition, but at six milligrams, it was, um, it was like really good for it. Uh, so basically, uh, I sell it in a four milligram per milliliter solution and half a milliliter is about two milligrams. And as far as the, um, the, I guess the sequence of effects, like is it an acute boost and it trails off and like lingers out 12 hours later? Like do you have data on like the half-life, for example? Yeah, that's another really cool thing to bring up because uh, the half-life is about nine and a half hours, whereas wow. it was shown in preclinical studies with rodents that um, cognition enhancement lasted about 24 hours after the half-life ended. So pretty much into the next day and beyond. And um, with other AMPA PAMs like IDRA 21, they actually found a lingering cognition enhancement for I think about 48 hours, but it's probably not selective to IDRA 21. Um, and also in the studies where they're conducting like depression uh, models, on rodents, they found that um, it took about six days for the antidepressant effects to reach significance. So there's probably a cumulative effects, at least in regards to that, which would be based around formation of new memories and synaptogenesis. Do we do we suspect that it might um, synergize really well with some other commonly used supplements or molecules? Like, have there been reports on or hypothetical scenarios of combining it, let's say with other, I don't know, like glutamatergic compounds. <laughs> um, so yeah, my next project, nevoglamine, is gonna be quite interesting because it also promotes um, kind of like an AMPA ergic effect in that it binds to the NMDA glycine site as a positive allosteric modulator. So the endogenous release of D-serine will bind more to the glycine site uh, which then releases glutamate, which then binds to AMPA, and it promotes mTOR expression, which then um, mm. would have an antidepressant effect as well as a procognitive effect. Um, and as an AMPA positive allosteric modulator, it also shares kind of it kind of overlaps with TAC in the way that it might have uh, better cognitive effects because they're more adapted to like the the uh, the um, what's it called um homeostatic mechanisms right okay so yeah. so this second this second molecule you're referring to neboglamine again did you want to maybe preface that and give us a bit of an understanding about is that naturally derived you know how is it like talk to us about no, that <laughs> it's uh it's just i just released it today actually it's it's one of my biggest projects um so 
basically I read a while ago about D serene and I was doing a ton of research on D serene because I saw that improved cognition in healthy people. And I saw that it was basically one of like the most ubiquitously beneficial uh, neurotransmitters, especially in regards to nootropic effects. Um, so basically nebulgamine mimics D serene in a lot of ways, but it does so in such a superior regard because uh, there's some issues with D serene and there's a number of reasons why um, they've been trying to like replace it and make better drugs and stuff like that. And those reasons would be that uh, D-serene on a low level, like a low amount uh, on a cellular level, it causes oxidative stress and it does so uh, without even having to bind to the NMDA receptor. And um, it's also a mild AMPA antagonist, which is not the best for cognition. And its dose is super high at like four to eight grams for uh, significant effects. Um, so nebulgamine basically was created, um, to kind of circumvent that. And also since it's a PAM, it has like a number of advantages that d could never even, uh, achieve on its own, um, because it would just be enhancing the endogenous d binding, which would promote AMPA expression a lot more than just d itself. This is, um, now making me think of, uh, sarcosine. Um, mm -hmm. did you want to maybe like loop that into the conversation here? Like how is sarcosine different to nabogamine? So sarcosine is a, um, sarcosine increases the synaptic, it increases glycine in the synaptic cleft, uh, which then could bind to the synaptic NMDA glycine site. Um, but you know, for a number of reasons, it's probably not the most ideal thing. I mean, it's on every chem, but I just think that nevoclamine is going to be a lot better. Uh, sarcosine, by increasing uh, glycine, glycine inhibits the synthesis of D-serine, um, which kind of limits the effect of sarcosine in many ways. And um, um, also, there are some studies where they gave sarcosine to uh, schizophrenic patients as a standalone and it didn't have any effects. And all the, the promising studies seem to be in conjunction with antipsychotics for the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So like the feeling down and the, the feeling detached type of thing. Um, so, yeah. Let's, uh, let's actually... Oh, yeah. I was just going to say real quick, sorry about that. Uh, D-serene, sure. it improved the negative cognitive and uh, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, just even oh, as yeah. a standalone. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh let's uncover more around this um because the things compounds that are considered antipsychotic in general like let's talk about that because obviously I have used a range of like antipsychotic supplements for example like L tetrahydropalmitine um, which is a D one D two antagonist from uh, Corydalis I've used ciproheptadine which uh, you know is a serotonin antagonist but it also has antipsychotic uh, effects like let's talk about this this antipsychotic action um naboglamine appears to have that effect so mm -hmm. what, what what does that actually even mean okay so basically in the schizophrenia model of uh psychosis uh schizophrenia can be characterized almost as a d serene deficiency because not only is d serene uh found lower in the serum of patients that have schizophrenia, but um, NMDA glycine site agonists are one of the most proven treatments for schizophrenia. And um, basically what it does is it stabilizes proper learning by binding to that NMDA glycine site, which then could normalize uh, dopamine overexpression that would be downstream of less NMDA expression. So, uh, Schizophrenia, they have one of the, the leading theories is just that there's an NMDA hypofunction. There's not enough uh, NMDA activity. So um, nebulgamine on its own didn't, I mean, and even D serene, they, they didn't impair locomotion. And in fact, there are studies where they gave D serene to patients with Parkinson's and it actually reversed their, their Parkinson's symptoms, um, which is pretty cool, probably uh, just by correcting learning. Um, so schizo schizophrenia, it might be 
a, an antipsychotic. I don't know if it would be uh, an antipsychotic uh, in every situation because it, it's not an anti-dopaminergic drug per se, uh, only in mm. certain contexts. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um, as far as like, let's just sort of segue and look at like ketamine, for example, I'm sure you've studied that quite extensively. It's mechanism of action, like mm. ketamine. I mean, from this, I could be wrong here, but why does ketamine, how can that induce schizophrenic? Like they use it to induce schizophrenia in, in rat models, right? Like they've actually used high dose ketamine to induce create a, a schizophrenic like state why does that occur yeah. do you think um it can happen even with uh repeated low dose uh uh nmda antagonists just over a long period of time uh and basically there's so, there's something called um uh, apparent synaptogenesis which is basically the formation of false memories and so it's almost like a memory disorder, uh, schizophrenia and ketamine by its nature of depressing the synaptic um, NMDA receptors, which is simultaneously what makes it such a strong antidepressant. Um, it would also be causing the formation of memories that are not necessarily correct because you change the whole uh, dynamic basically of how memories are formed and kind of been creating so many new memories through that enhanced AMPA expression uh, that you've created a new reality of what you would think and what you would find normal. So it, cre it creates aberrant behavior, psychotic symptoms, and uh, manic episodes, uh, partially from the memories, but also just because of the fact that NMDA antagonism uh, increases the release of dopamine. And low dose amphetamine has also been shown to cause aberrant behavior in primates when it's been given uh, continuously over a long period of time. I'm so glad you brought that up because I've, I've actually got a, a YouTube video coming out on um, microdosing. Not that I'm, I would never, ever recommend this. Obviously, this is not for human consumption, but um, it's just understanding mechanisms and pathways. But yeah, low dose, extremely low dose amphetamines for a naive user. Um, and even in rhesus monkeys, induced sustained elevations in uh, dopamine. It caused dopamine super sensitivity where they actually displayed, um, even for like eight months after administration. Um, what this about is really, uh, As in like after stopping, you mean? Mm -hmm. they after stopping, no, after stopping, they still had these this hypersensitivity, dopamine super sensitivity from the microdosing of uh, like low dose amphetamines, which was pretty crazy. Um, yeah, so that's actually behavioral sensitization, which is enhanced response to a drug. It's simultaneously uh, what makes drugs addictive and it plays a role in their withdrawal and dependence um, because you continue to get uh, a more complicated framework in the brain that, that connects the drug to the reward and then your response to the reward and you become like, stronger you be, it just grows stronger and stronger over time um and then at that study if they were to remove the amphetamine like they did in the primate model uh that i was talking about earlier where they developed psychotic symptoms if you were to remove it uh there would have been a depression in dopamine and lack of locomotion which is what they found um which is just due to the fact that the framework has become too dependent on um amphetamine Mm. So you're mentioning it's you're mentioning a common phenomenon. I find it so fascinating. We could probably dedicate an entire, like, just an entire episode to looking at um, like dopaminergic Dopamine. hypothesis and stuff. Yeah, yeah. We both, I guess, we're both very interested in that. Um, yeah. But the that was I the wanna, my entire company. Well, what was the first? Let's talk about the very first compound that you were like to with every chem. Like, what was the very first compound that you actually decided to? You know, I guess so. Like, okay. So every chem uh, was a rebranding, and because my my uh, domain provider um, just basically kicked me off because somebody was kind of giving me a raid and like mass reporting me and trying to mess with me. Um, but I rebranded as every chem, and um, and my first product on bromantane.co, uh, which is my first site, was bromantane spray. Um, 
And it was based around Bromantane for a while because that's just all I had at the moment, you know what I'm saying? And um, yeah, so that's probably what I've studied the most is Bromantane, um, just because it's what I've seen in the literature to be one of the only compounds that enhances dopaminergic behavior even after discontinuation. Um, and of course, during a lot. And um, this kind of resulted in like a number of uh, motivational things and studies. They called it operant status, which is basically to translate it to like a Western science, it'd be like the dopamine motivation, um, locomotion thing that they kind of use as a model for uh, the behavioral effects of dopamine. You know, this, um, and um, you know, I'm glad you brought up bromantane because that's also one of the one of the earlier compounds that I tried and was blown away by just how potent the effects were. And I actually think somehow, I actually do think that the first time that I used it, I think it triggered a hypomanic episode because I was like, yeah. Um, yeah, cause the thing is like, I was, I was actually sleeping like four to five hours per night, but I was feeling absurdly energetic and, and absurdly like hyper aroused and excited and, and just hot, like talking so much and stuff like that. So I remember my, um, initial response to Brain Man was very potent. And I mean, based on its mechanism of action, it's delayed effect as well. Upregulating tyrosine hydroxylase, like I've spoken about it a lot. Um, but you're mentioning this locomotion, people are going to be listening into this and they, they, they're not going to really probably understand this hyper locomotion hypo, like, do you want to yeah. say, like, explore what that even means? Yeah. So locomotion is basically movement. And what we see in Parkinson's patients who have no dopamine is they can't move. They, they're stuck in bed. Uh, you need the D2 receptor to move. And, um, that's basically why it's used in research and why it's, kind of like stereotyped as being a dopaminergic thing. Um, and to touch down on that, what you're saying about tyrosine hydroxylase, uh, bromantane, that is kind of like the rate limiting effect of uh, dopamine synthesis and bromantane would kind of override that and upregulate it leading to more dopamine promotion. But what's cool, and this is just my theory, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Purpose this by by saying it, it's my theory, but there's a lot of reason for me to believe this. I believe it's a CUR 2.1 uh, potassium channel inhibitor, um, and that would make sense because bromantane resulted in less work errors and it had kind of an overall inhibitory effect. Uh, and that's because CUR 2.1 potassium channel inhibitor is like a mantinine, which bromantane is an analog of. Um, they basically stabilized the direct and indirect medium spiny neurons, which led to more correct behavior, as well as just an overall beneficial effect uh, to dopamine. And that's why amantadine is used as an anti-Parkinson's drug. Um, and yeah, it's probably playing a role in the, the upregulation through uh, GDNF and BDNF and things that uh, have been shown. GDNF injections actually given to Parkinson's uh, patients actually reversed their symptoms for like three years, which is, you know, probably one of the strongest pieces of, of data we have to explain bromantane and how it connects to amantadine and uh, all that. Um, mm. Because amantadine also was shown to prevent the on and the off uh, effects of L-DOPA treatment. And on would be like, they kind of get like, like shaky and get like, you know, spasms and stuff like that. Whereas off would be like, oh, like even worse Parkinson's where they just can't move at all. And, you know, stuff like that, which is just because of the aberrant synaptogenesis from L-DOPA um, and the tolerance around it. Mm, I'm glad you brought up- uh, on and off. I'm really glad that you brought up amantadine because I've actually got some in the mail on its way. It's a molecule that I've been looking at for a number of years, but- um, I may or may not actually try it myself. It depends on the, the environment that I'm in and also whether or not I'm willing to continue to be the lab rat. I'm actually, I'm so, sometimes I get kind of sick of being a lab rat. Um, yeah, yeah. But, That's why I only use things that have uh, testing and healthy, healthy patients and are shown to be safe and, and stuff like that. You know, I don't want to risk it either. So 
that's why, you know, that's why it's always good to be safe. It's always good to read the data and know what you're consuming. Um, and just, you know what I'm saying? Just do your due diligence and I'm sure you'll be fine. Um, hmm. What I was going to say is I think that bromantane is probably better than amantanine, probably more dopaminergic. I remember like the Russian uh, studies, they, they like had like a list of like 300 different adamantane compounds. And then they like saw that bromantane was like the most dopaminergic out of all of them. And I know that amantanine also has a lot higher affinity uh, over uh, bromantane as an NMDA antagonist and possibly uh, even as an anticholinergic um, which you can evade even further by avoiding using bromantain orally. Interesting. Interesting. With, uh, with the, you mentioned the inhibition of the Ker 2.1 potassium channels. That's your, that's your hy hypothesis there. Are there any other molecules and compounds that also do that inhibition of, um, Viagra. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like, is that's one of the pro, the pro sexual effects of Viagra is what you're saying. Uh, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it, I think that the PDE five inhibition, oh, yeah. uh, is probably playing a role there, but, um, yeah, I didn't know that either until, until recently. Um, I don't know how significant it is. I think they said it was at a therapeutic dosage. It was relevant. Um, hmm. but yeah, it's, a. Uh, it's a crew 2.1 potassium channel inhibitor and it's, it's definitely shown to have a dopaminergic effects. Um, so that makes sense. Interesting. Interesting. What about like you mentioned repeated administration of low dose NMDA antagonists um, that having some interesting effects. I mean, magnesium L3 and eight, for example, mm -hmm. is a you know, yeah. commonly used supplement. Some people say that it can help reverse stimulant tolerance. Um, did you want to explore? Yeah, let's let's explore that. Okay, so magnesium normally it, it kind of is rate limited into the brain, and magnesium L three and eight circumvents this uh, because L three and eight leads to more transportation. It's not the magnesium L three and eight combination. It's just literally the L three and eight, which is it's attached to. Apparently, like they separate into the serum into magnesium uh, and L three and eight, and then only like part of it remains intact into the brain. Um, but the L3 and 8 leads to more magnesium transport through the brain, and this saturates the uh, intracellular and synaptic regions of um, the NMDA receptor. Um, so it acts as an NMDA antagonist. And then uh, with L3 and 8, they're, they're, it, once it's completely saturated, it just starts to fill up the, the extracellular, extrasynaptic spaces. And then the result of that is, is a more selective uh, extrasynaptic NMDA receptor antagonism. And um, that's, that's a, a big difference from a synaptic NMDA receptor antagonist like ketamine. So while I would say that magnesium or magnesium L3 and 8 would be good for um, like Alzheimer's or aging of the brain and stuff like that, I would say that it could worsen social defeat and it might also just make you like a little more submissive and hypnotizable, uh, especially given the fact that it also stimulates oxytocin production. And um, um, what was I going to say? Something else relating to magnesium. Uh, if I if I remember it, we'll, I'll come back on it. But yeah, that's just what I know right now for for magtine. Um, oh, now I remember. Memantine also was shown not mm. to be a uh, effective antidepressant, and it's also more selective to the extrasynaptic sites. So that's probably why um, it's also an A7 nicotinic receptor antagonist, uh, which is anticognitive. Um, whereas extrasynaptic NMDA receptor antagonism would be pro-cognitive uh, while also having its negative effects on social defeat because you would no longer have the correct ability to prune synapses and make the, the correct uh, memories. I'm glad you brought up that um, the A7 nicotinic uh, receptor because that's obviously a very pro-cognitive, pro-cognition mm -hmm. target for a lot of um, mm -hmm. substances. If somebody were to ask you, like, how can we mimic the effects of nicotine 
or like what's mm. a what's a what's a molecule that you think has like similar effects to nicotine or or like without the side effects sort of so the procognitive effects i would say are going to be more biased towards those alpha 7 nicotinic receptors whereas kind of the euphoric effects would be those alpha 4 beta 2 receptors, which is where uh, nicotine primarily binds, and then it releases dopamine and uh, leads to more opioid endorphin production and therefore addiction. And um, I would I would say that I, I have carried in and, and I look into uh, that I've looked into the alpha seven nicotinic receptors and found tropocetron, which is a partial agonist, which simultaneously prevents the um, the neurotoxic effects of alpha-7 uh, nicotinic receptor overstimulation while uh, still stimulating it. So you still get the cognitive effects. And it's also a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, which helps OCD, anxiety, and prevents the nauseous effect of A7. So uh, there's a study in GTS-21, which is a selective A7 uh, partial agonist and it improved cognition in healthy people, but then it moved on to, I think, phase two trials, and it was given to people, and almost half of them uh, developed nausea, and uh, while there's no, like, procognitive studies on um, tropocetron, except for in primates, uh, where it did increase cognition a lot, um, I'd still say it's very relevant just because of that alpha-7 uh, action that it has. Mm, really, really, really fascinating stuff there. Um, my yeah. also, I just yeah. want real quick before we move on from tropocetron. There's another uh, selective. It, it's basically this, a cetron is a class of five HT three antagonists, and there was um, uh, a study that showed that um, tropocetron was twenty times more potent than diazepam in preclinical studies for treating uh, anxiety, and it was also. Um, it was also shown in uh, anxious patients to help anxiety, although not to that extent. Um, and uh, I think Audis, Audan Cetron is another 5-HT3 antagonist that has also shown some superiority over diazepam. So, yeah, I just want so, to say that. I think that's cool. Well, this this uh, Tropicetron, um, what was the original development? Like, why did they first want to develop the was it as an anti-nausea drug or like what was the original use yeah 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 so it was developed as an anti-nausea drug and it's also been shown to help the positive negative and uh cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia because the alpha 7 uh nicotinic receptor is actually released deserine which is probably why they're pro-cognitive which is probably why nebulgamine is even better um but yeah it was developed for nausea and cancer patients because their their medications made them sick and uh, it's also been shown to help autoimmune pain, um, among other things. Mm, interesting. You sort of touched on um, a pathway that's neglected quite a lot in the, I guess, the mood optimization space, which is the opioid pathway. Out of curiosity, have you explored other novel like Kappa antagonists or did you ever explore that pathway? Um, I looked into it, but I lost interest because once I learned that core antagonism depressed the uh, serotonin transporter, uh, similarly to an SSRI, um, I learned that that might be why it's causing an antidepressant effect and then heart issues and uh, the one that was given to people. Um, and I also kind of just didn't see how like KOR antagonism long-term would continue to have dopaminergic effects or why it wouldn't eventually build tolerance um, just because of the KOR receptor either upregulating or the dopamine itself causing intolerance to itself. So um, I think there's also, I think it's also a useful receptor for reward disengagement. Um, so for that reason as well, you know, I just didn't see it being that optimal. So I, I kind of just lost interest there with it. What about the uh, the opposite, which would be like core agonism and like repeated low dose of core ag agonism? <laughs> uh, I think you, I don't know. I know that there's one that's pretty crazy, the salvia. Yeah. Um, 
Although, you know, I, I, I don't know if that would exactly be something you'd want every day. You probably wouldn't feel, you probably wouldn't like it, you know? Yeah. I just kind of leave it be in my opinion. What about like um, some other, have there been certain alkaloids that you've seen in nature or certain herbal extracts that's like caught your attention and been like, oh, wow, we need to explore this? Absolutely. Um, oddly enough, nobody ever seems to really talk about them, but I actually carried one of them. It was carnosic acid, like a 95% uh, extract from rosemary. Uh, it was shown to kind of have a anti-anxiety effects by increasing uh, serotonin, not through the serotonin transport transporter, but through the uh, synthesis of it, uh, as well as decrease the synthesis of noradrenaline. And um, it kind of had anti-anxiety anti effects similar to a, a benzo in the preclinical model in rodents. And um, it's also a very effective antioxidant because it seems to decrease the uh, proliferation of cancer cells while increasing the proliferation of healthy cells. Um, so it's been a very, um, a very interesting compound. It's a bit sedating um but it has its uses for sure as a, as an herb and there's other ones too such as white willow bark extract which uh produces even greater uh, pain killing effects than aspirin but has none of the gastrointestinal side effects and uh i don't know if you've seen but like aspirin also seems to have somewhat of a pro dopaminergic effect and it also prolongs the uh the locomotive and stimulatory effects of caffeine so white willow bark and caffeine uh, initially, before I even got into nootropics and all this stuff, I was gonna, I was thinking I should create a business where like I sell like an energy drink with like white willow bark extract and caffeine yeah. because nobody seems to really uh, know about this, but it's it's just like a very interesting herbal compound. Although usually I'm not too interested in herbs because they're like the second leading cause of liver failure in the United States. And um, there, a lot of them have uh, off targets a lot of, like a lot of the whole purpose of like um, pharmaceutical development is to kind of perfect on herbal molecules to get rid of the the negative off targets like the cytotoxicity in the liver like anything else like that as well as like kind of enhance the positive effects of what it does although there's definitely uh, some herbs that are very slept on another one would be Ceylon cinnamon extract um, which decreases the, um, the breakdown of D amino acids, increasing D serine uh, in the brain. So this is a really cool. fantastic, fantastic discussion. Cause um, my dad being a, my dad's a pharmacist, but I studied, um, I had the choice to go down that pathway, but I'm, I studied naturopathy, but now I'm like, I'm sort of in between and I'm sort of interested in both worlds really. Um, I think but you, you definitely mentioned... found your niche, you know? Oh, You're for sure. Thanks, man. I think um, I, I'm, I'm impressed with your your repertoire as well. I mean, this is like, I think my audience will be listening into this. And they'll be like, these guys need to collaborate and release their own product together because like <laughs> it would be phenomenal. Hey, I mean, I mean, I could help you if you want. I'll, I'll tell you whatever I've learned. I mean, like I said, you could create a product with with white willow bark and, and caffeine and that would definitely that would definitely, you know, go to the top, man. That would be a good one. You well, you mentioned for human consumption. You mentioned the the carnosic acid from rosemary, um, rosemary extract. Uh, again, rosemary. I'm, oh no, I'm thinking of lemon balm now. Sorry, the GABA transaminase inhibitor. Um, but carnosic acid is it relatively easy to synthesize? Is the dosage, you know, what's the oral dosage like? How does that work? So one reason why it's better to have pure carnosic acid instead of like a weaker extract uh, from rosemary is, is that like in rosemary, there's some anti-androgen like pro-estrogen compounds. So it's a little bit demasculinizing to, to use like uh, rosemary just alone. Uh, I don't know. I know that there's a lot of carnosic acid in uh in rosemary, although um, I don't know how much exactly. I don't know how, I don't, I don't really do a whole lot of chemistry work. I'm more into studying pharmacology and stuff like that. Um, but I think carnosic acid, the dose would be like, um, 
forget what it is in rodents. I don't think that it's been studied in people yet. Um, but I think based on the my initial experiences using another carnosic acid product, I would estimate that uh, I was getting around 400 milligrams from their their product. Yep. Yep. Of that's um, carnosic acid. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, before you mentioned, um, you mentioned like uh, studying, so studying drugs and then uh, the second leading cause of liver failure is her, like the use of herbal extracts, things like that. And this is a, mm. this is a discussion that I love to get into, which is like, um, okay, we've got the herbal extract, which has like thousands of different compounds, thousands of different like molecules. We don't truly know what the active constituent oftentimes is. Sometimes it could actually be the metabolite of let's say, like for example, green tea, like matcha, you know, everyone's mm. focusing on, on L-theanine. But what if there's some other weird novel, un, like unknown molecule that's actually responsible for the the alpha wave increasing effect or like, and then should we be so specific and like try and isolate and pull out that one molecule? But then when we administer that molecule to humans, like it may be a chemical straitjacket and target one particular receptor, but then like then it might have some other collateral damage, but that's a discussion I love to, I love to you know, look out. Effects. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I mean, kind of, kind of that is like a thing that you see is sometimes it's an entourage effect. Uh, speaking about matcha in particular, you're getting a lot of, it's not necessarily the L-theanine. Uh, there's a lot of EGCG in there, which then metabolizes into like a significant amount of EC, I believe. Um, no way I'll be able to pronounce the whole thing, but, um, there is like a lot of that that enters the bloodstream and then a lot that will make it to the brain. And, um, there's also significantly probably more caffeine I'd imagine as well. Uh, when you're getting like a lot of that, that condensed down green tea and, um, yeah, uh, it's definitely a good tasting drink. Um, Although I personally never really got a whole lot out of L-theanine, uh, besides maybe like some slight fatigue feeling. Mm. It's an AMPA antagonist too, which isn't that great. Yeah, so d d dumb you down is what you're saying. Um, I mean, it doesn't seem to in studies, but like, I don't know why it's talked about as a nootropic so much. Like it doesn't really... Like I know that like they they like it on like the R slash nootropics moderation mm -hmm. team. They're always talking about how much they love it, but I won't get into that. Yeah. What about like uh, another molecule that I'm thinking about, which I'm not sure if you've explored much at all, is four scolin. Um, have you did yeah, you yeah. look into that? <laughs> yeah, I did. It was a long time ago. I was super I thought that it was gonna be like the the ultimate dopamine testosterone inducing thing. And then I, first thing that happened is I, I tried it instantly felt like I had to crap. And, uh, and I was oh, like, yeah. even on a low dose because it increases uh, cyclic adenosine monophosphate in your uh, low, in your, your lower organs, which, you know, speeds things up. Uh, you'll get the same effect with some other drugs that are similar, like PDE uh, four inhibitors, I, I think. And um, yeah. I'll, I mean, it, it seems like force going builds uh, kind of like a kind of like a behavioral sensitization similar to dopaminergics do, in that it like it increased its own binding at the expense of the endogenous uh, uh, um, adenylate cyclase uh, agonist site where where it'd be binding to and yeah, it kind of led to like a dependence on the uh, forskolin and it also increased the norfin synthesis by like seven times and uh, decreased sigma receptor activation in the brain, I think. Um, it might be increased, don't call me on that. Um, but there's other bad things that it did. It's just been a while since I've actually looked into it. I also just think that it might not be ideal for increasing memory because there's no selectivity to it. Like with an allosteric modulator, you get a lot of selectivity because these 
things are released in the brain naturally, and then you're just increasing the binding. Um, but with something like four skull and you're just really like, it's also very non-selective, like there's adenylate cyclase all throughout your entire body. And when you hit it all at once, it just does like a lot of crazy stuff. That's why you poop when you're on it, you know? Interesting. Yeah. Um, another, another pathway, um, that I'd love to explore. I know you've got a range of other molecules. You've got the phaso PRL 853. Um, you've got the Selenk and C-Max, um, what about, cause my listeners will be interested. I'm just trying to think about like what's running through their mind right now. They're probably thinking, uh, how can we potentially, <laughs> well, they'd be thinking these two nerds just geeking out on a podcast. This is yeah. just hilarious. <laughs> I hope um, they know what I'm saying. I don't, I don't uh, dumb things down enough. So <laughs> it kind of can come out too blind, too wordy. And I, I just hope that people know what I'm saying. No, that's, that's, that's fine. What about, cause I'd be thinking about ways to potentiate caffeine or ways to reset uh, caffeine tolerance by interacting with the adenosine receptors. Like surely you've explored that pathway. Yeah. So I actually have a, well, yeah, I do have a compound listed called estradiophelin, which is a selective A2A adenosine receptor antagonist. And um, basically uh, it doesn't build tolerance at the A2A site. Um, a lot of caffeine's issues seems to come from the fact that it's also an adenosine A1 antagonist, um, which unlike uh, A2A seems to upregulate as well as cause like the, the anxious symptoms and elevated heart rate and, and stuff like that, more of like the noradrenergic effects, sympathetic effects. Uh, seem to be from A1 antagonism, whereas um, A2A antagonism seems quite sustainable. And that's why they gave it to Parkinson's patients. Um, I think that caffeine can also be potentiated with Alcar uh, because Alcar had a study where it increased uh, dopamine release even after discontinuation. Um, and it would also put, potentiate the cholinergic effect of caffeine. In case you didn't know, caffeine is a cholinesterase inhibitor. Um, and by giving Although, Alcar, it would increase uh, acetylcholine and, and dopamine. But the, the um, ACE, ACHE inhibition would be much less than um, Huperzine A, for example, though, right? Yeah, the, the ACH. Um, it's definitely a lot less than Huperzine and Gallimantine and uh, Donzapil and all like the, the standard uh, cholinesterase inhibitor compounds. Um, but it's definitely still there. Um, and that, so that, is, that can be shown in a, in a lot of different ways. So this estradifiline, which is an adenosine A2A receptor antagonist, they're studying it as an adjunctive therapy to levodopa. Why? I'm confused how that's like, how does that play into Parkinson's? How does the adenosine pathway link into Parkinson's or improving the efficacy of these dopaminergics? Well, not only is A2A um, higher express in a lot of mm. patients with dementia, but... Um, it, it, it increases the striatum dopamine uh, when you antagonize those A2As. So for it not to upregulate with continued use of an antagonist is pretty important. And by basically selectively antagonizing it uh, with like a long half-life and a very good uh, selectivity to just that receptor, you're increasing the striatum dopamine and it's it, it will help with like the ups and downs of L-dopa treatment as well as potentially working as a monotherapy. Although I don't know if it's been tested as a monotherapy just yet uh, with crazy success or anything. I'm just saying it, it probably could be. Now, another molecule that you've listed is idebenone. I have tried idebenone a long time ago, but it was literally, it was probably about five years ago now. And I can't remember I mean, I slightly remember my subjective experience. I think I remember, I remember going into class, 
And I felt like my mood was a little bit like uplifted more than usual. Um, yeah. But let's explore idebanone because that's been around for a while. Like what, what does that mm. do? What's the mechanism there? Um, so it basically, it, it works through the electron transport chain. It kind of works as like an indirect antioxidant. And um, it, it increases the expression of antioxidant enzymes as well as the, the production of ATP. And um, the result is that it increases serotonin and it might increase noradrenaline, although there's a, a study that shows it increasing noradrenaline and one that shows it not increasing it. So um, I think that it's interesting for its ATP promotion uh, personally, it just kind of makes me feel like a little bit better. And I do use it from time to time. Um, I find it's like a little bit stimulating. And I think what they used in studies for effects, like they had to use like 200, 300 milligrams or otherwise it didn't work. So yeah, it's it, people talk about the bad bioavailability of it, uh, but it's actually a pro drug to something called QS10, uh, which has a similar mechanism. So even though it has like a bioavailability of 1%, um, there's quite a, a lot more that is just being metabolized into this other thing that just works better. So, mm. yeah. Interesting. And for those listening in, idebanone is actually an analog of coenzyme Q10. Um, so that just to give you some context about like how it may work as an antioxidant, you, you mentioned as, you know, supporting the electron transport tra- uh like ETC. Um, what about, oh man, this is going to be really interesting is oxytocin and how oxytocin affects cognition. I'm sure. Have you explored that pathway? And, you know, sort of share that. Um, kind of like half and half. I've briefly read some studies where it could help some things and worse than others. Uh, although I personally would not recommend oxytocin because oxytocin mediates hypnotization. And as you know, in this world, we're constantly exposed to a lot of things that are trying to instill fear in us. And there's a lot of things that are trying to brainwash us into believing a lot of narratives, especially politically, and trying to get us to give up all of our rights as human beings. So I try to just avoid anything that would increase any susceptibility to that. Although I do take l unfortunately, which does increase... Uh, oxytocin production, but that's because of the testosterone enhancement. So it's the osteophorus one from BioGaia. And um, I just, I, I don't know. I mean, oxytocin, while there's some studies showing it helping like autism and stuff like that, I just, I just personally don't believe in it. I think that they should try to find a better cure for autism than uh, oxytocin. And I don't know. That's just my opinion though. Yeah. Interesting. It's, it's the, uh, one of the, I mean, it's a hormone that I've been wanting to acquire just to subjectively see what oxytocin subjectively feels like, uh, but I am cautious of like when and where to use it and also, um, yeah, whether or not it can aggravate like prostate issues, which I've read, it, it actually can, it's higher in um, BPH, things like that. Um, but there's two things that popped up just there. First of all, Fear, extinct, fear extinction compounds. Um, we haven't even really explored that pathway and also the autism. So we'll start with the um, fear extinction because I think that's where I first learned about D-serine having some sort of like yeah. anti-fear. Yeah, so do you want to sort of explore that? So um, the cool thing about D-serine in the context of fear extinction is that it doesn't necessarily worsen fear as much as say an NNTA agonist without any affinity to the glycine site would have. Basically there's compounds that could simultaneously help fear extinction by just non-selectively enhancing memory um, and learning in that, in that moment, but it could also worsen it if it's like happening at the same time, say with a uh, um, uh, HDAC inhibitors like valproate for instance, uh, it could worsen the the learning of these traumatic memories, but it could also help it if taking it and you're not in a traumatic circumstance. Um, 
So I'm hoping that something like Neville Gumi will be the best of both worlds. We'll simultaneously be resistant to that trauma um, by leaving the extrasynaptic NMDA intact while simultaneously strengthening, strengthening and fine tuning uh, the NMDA receptor. And um, fear extinction, it, it basically, you're just overriding memories with new memories. Um, that's basically it. And the fear extinction, like models that they use in studies, like in rat studies, is it, is it, um, oh, it's not the novel object recognition. It's like, what do they do to like assess whether or not a rat, how, how do they assess like fear extinction in these, in some of the rat studies? I think they produce a trauma in them and then they isolate the rat and then they uh, give it the drug and then they just test if it's better or if it's not. Interesting. So that's okay. probably what they do. Yeah. And the other thing that we mentioned before, you said uh, you sort of hope that there's going to be another, like a better cure for autism. What have you read as far as like the links between like serotonin and autism? Um, it's higher in autism, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I've also yeah, read that as well. It's higher in social anxiety and I think even depression, it's higher. Although I don't know what that means. Um, I know that mm. some 5-HT3 antagonists um, have been shown to help some anxious sy symptoms and some conditions that kind of correlate with autism. Although I haven't done a whole lot of research into autism, admittedly. Um, I know that HDAC inhibitors are given to, um, if they're given to rodents and it produces more autistic symptoms. Um, so I guess something involving HDAC, maybe it's activation or inhibiting its deactivation could, could work in some contexts. Um, I just don't know what, I know that they, they one time like gave cerebralizin injections to, auti to autistic patients and they saw some recovery. Although I don't, I don't think it was that, uh, groundbreaking the, the overall results, um, Hmm. But uh, I know that omega threes hmm. might be something to consider, although I don't know if it was a significant outcome in clinical trials. Yeah, I so, think the I think the EPA, gut. I think. Yeah, I think the oh yeah EPA that would make sense. I think the gut microbiome, like the um. The short chain fatty acids. I remember there was a really strong link between the propion, propionate or propionic acid, which is one of the three short chain fatty acids, butyrate, acetate, propionate. And propionate has has a very strong correlation with autistic like symptoms. But um, yeah, there's probably a, there's a lot to explore there. But um, man, I think we've we've covered quite a lot. We're probably gonna have to break this up into two separate episodes because there's so much we can explore yeah. um yeah that's what i was imagining definitely definitely gonna have to get you back on the show we, we will definitely be in touch obviously after this and um explore some other really cool pathways and avenues for potentially like business collaboration ideas as well we can potentially explore releasing perhaps even products together down the line yeah that'd be cool um but that's pretty much it for today uh, i just want to say thank you again for for coming on the show no problem no problem like i'm happy to be here i'm glad this information is finally getting getting uh posted somewhere i'm glad people are able to learn this stuff because i mean i haven't been promoting any of this stuff you know so it's cool to like actually uh get the word out there about these new scientific avenues that people can explore and learn about themselves with Absolutely. And, yeah. and I know my, my audience will be, um, a lot of my audience will be very excited to be, you know, exploring some of the things you mentioned and very aligned with your, your mission and stuff. So, um, yeah, awesome to have you on the show, man. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right.